Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called Calculating Probability. This is part one. Now, in truth, when I introduced probability in the previous lesson, we've already kind of done some calculations with probability. Here, we're going to formalize it more, we're going to get a lot more practice with it, and also just kind of reinforce what we've already learned in the past. And also, we're going to use the probability concept to make predictions. Remember, I told you in the previous lesson that the probability is just telling you kind of the likelihood of something happening. But if you perform the trials or the experiment over and over and over again, as you approach infinity, if you do like a hundred thousand coin flips, then you expect that with a really large number of trials, like a hundred thousand or a million, that the one half probability that we get for a coin flip should start to be reflected in our observation. In other words, if you flip a coin two or three times, it's not going to exactly give you 50% heads or tails. But if you flip a coin maybe a hundred thousand times, then we should get pretty close to half and half heads and tails. And the more trials that you do, the closer and closer what we observe is what we actually, uh, the closer we get to what we calculate in terms of the probability. That's what probability is. It's telling you what you should observe if you perform a large number of trials, right? That's what you should observe. All right, so let's take a look at our first problem. That was actually part B right there. Let's take a look at part A. Shea flips a dime. What is the probability the dime will land on heads? So how we calculate probability, as we have kind of talked about in the past, is we have to first of all take a look at what outcomes we could have. If we flip a dime, we have heads, we have tails. So we have the uh, outcome, which could be a heads, but we also have the outcome that there could be a tails. There's only two possible outcomes, but the outcome I'm interested in is the probability the dime will land on heads. So you ask yourself, of these two possible outcomes, how many ways can I get a heads? Well, there's only one heads here, and there's only one tails, but there's only one heads. So what this basically is telling you, you have one outcome that is a head out of a possible two outcomes of the experiment. So you write it as one over two, and that's really it. You would write it as the probability parentheses heads. This is how you write it. This does not mean multiplication. This does not mean anything fancy. It just means probability of getting a heads uh, is equal to one half, right? Now, just for giggles, let's continue uh, so I should say one half. I guess I'll put the one half right here, one half. And then we also know that one half, when we divide it out, it gets it gives a 0 0.5. So you can also write that as a decimal 0 0.5 because remember probabilities can be expressed as fractions. They can also be expressed as decimals from zero, which is zero probability, all the way up to one, which is a like 100%. So you can express it as a percentage. You could call this 50% also. But in general, in probability, we don't use percentages. We do sometimes, but not always. So you could call it probability one half, probability 0 0.5. Now, let me continue with my thought here. Instead of calculating the probability of heads, let's figure out what is the probability of tails. Right, so again, you ask yourselves, how many ways can I get tails? Well, there's only one of them. And how many possible outcomes are there? There's two. And so the probability of getting tails is one half. So you can see that the probability of heads is a half and the probability of, roll, of flipping and getting tails is also a half. They're equal probabilities. The reason they're equal probabilities is because there's only two sides to the coin, and if the coin is balanced, then half the time it should land on one side, and the other half the time it should land on the other side. Now, if you flip this coin twice, you may get two heads in a row. You may get two tails in a row, but you may also get heads and tails one after another. You see what I'm saying? So when you do a small number of flips, you may not get something that's exactly equal to half heads and half tails. If I flip it four times, you would expect two heads and two tails. If I roll it six times, you would, or flip it six times, you would expect three heads and three tails. But you all know from experience that it doesn't always fall out like that. But if you flip it a hundred times, you should get something pretty close to 50 heads, 50 tails. If you flip it a thousand times, you should get something pretty close to half and half heads and tails, 500 and 500. But it may not be exactly right. It may be 499 heads, 501 tails. But if you flip this thing a million times, or 10 million times, or 100 trillion times, the more flips you do, the closer that our observation is going to actually work out to be 50-50 heads and tails. That's what probability is. It's telling you that if you do an infinite number of flips, what should I expect? If I do a small number of flips, it, it may come out to close to it, it might not. But on average, if I do a large number of flips, it should be half and half because the probabilities came out to half and half. So now that we know the probability of, of landing on heads is one half, or equivalently 0 0.5, let's answer part two. 
Using this answer, how many heads would you expect Shay to get if she flips the dime 20 times? Now this is where we earn our money, because we know the probability of heads. We know the probability of heads is equal to one half. So that means half of the time we should get a heads. So if we then flip this thing 20 times, then we can calculate how many heads we get by taking the probability of heads and multiply by the number of flips, which is 20. But this 20 can be written as 20 over one, because any number can be written as itself over one. And we know how to multiply fractions. One times 20 is 20. And two times one is two. And 20, that's not 26, 20 divided by two is 10. So what have we learned from this? We know the probability of, of getting a heads is one half. And so we know then, if we flip 20 times, half of them should be heads, and that's what we get. Ten, we expect 10 of these flips to be heads. Now we know from experience, again, that if we actually do flip it 20 times, we may not get 10 heads and 10 tails. We may get, you know, I don't know, 12 heads and eight tails. They still have to add to 20. Right? It may be close, but as you perform more and more experiments, maybe you do it 40 times, you expect 20 and 20, right? And it'll be a little closer to 20 and 20. If you roll it a thousand times, it'll be 500 and 500, and it'll get closer and closer to what you predict the more number of flips or trials that you do. So we expect 10 times if we uh, flip it uh, 20 times there, because the probability is one half. Now let's take a look at the next problem. How many heads would I expect Shay to get if I flip the coin, the coin 75 times? Well, same sort of thing. The probability is one half. I'm going to multiply by the number of flips I have, 75, and I can write this as 75 over 1. 1 times 75 is 75, and 2 times 1 is 2. And when you take 75 and divide it by 2 and do the long division, you get 37.5. Now look at this, 37.5. So what it means is, I'll put times here. So what it means is, if I actually flip this dime 75 times, I expect to get heads 37.5 times. What does it mean to be 37.5 times? You see, in probability, it's just an average thing. You, you can't get half of a flip. We know this. But what it really means when we calculate this is it's somewhere between 37 and 38 times. Right? Because it was an odd number divided by two, you get a decimal here, but this just means it's just giving you an idea of what's going to happen. Well, you can't actually have half of a flip, so it has to be somewhere between 37 and 38 times. So between 37 and 38 times. That's what you would expect. Now, in reality, if you flip this thing 75 times, maybe it's not exactly that close because 75 flips, that's a fair number of flips, but it's not like a thousand flips. But as I do more and more flips, I will get closer and closer to what I predict with half heads and half tails. So let me take these down. We have more problems to practice our skills with calculating probability. All right, problem number two, it says Dylan spins the spinner below. What is the probability the spinner will land on the number three? So what we have to do is figure out how many ways can we land on the number three and you can see there's only one square out of four uh, that we can do that. So the probability, you just write it as P of landing on the number three, is how many ways can I land on three? There's only one of them here, so I can only land on the three one position out of the total number of positions I can land on, one out of four. So you would say the probability is one fourth, and you could, if you wanted to, write this as 0 0.25 as a decimal, or you could convert to a percentage, which would be move the decimal 25%, so two, two positions, 25%. So every probability problem you do will be how many ways can I get um, uh, the outcome I'm looking for divided by or in fraction with how many total outcomes are there? So the answer is one fourth. So that would mean 25% of the time you would expect to land on the number three, about a quarter of the time. All right, and what does that mean exactly? Like if I spin this spinner a hundred times, 100 multiplied by a four, one fourth is 25 times. So that would mean if I spin the spinner 100 times, I expect to land on that position 25 times. Will it be exactly 25? No, it'd be a little bit less, a little bit more. But if I ran this experiment a thousand or a million times, then the 25% number for landing on the number three, I guess I think I said the number four a minute ago, the number three will be closer and closer to what I predict with the probability. All right, let's take a look at the next problem. We spin the spinner. Uh, George spins the spinner next. What is the probability it will land on an even number? An even number. So we have the probability of landing on an even number. 
question you have to ask yourself is how many ways can I land on an even number? Well, these, these are the two numbers that are even. These are odd. There's actually two different positions I can land on to satisfy this being an even number. So the answer is two positions out of a total of four positions. See, it's the same recipe every time. How many times can I get what I'm looking for? Divided by how many total positions are in there? Are there? And two-fourths, you know, reduces to one-half. Divide by two, divide by two, you get one-half. And you know that this also works out to 0.5. So the probability of landing on an even position is one-half. And you could then also say that that's 0.5 or 50%, uh, but usually you just leave it as a fraction. So what does this mean? If I spin this spinner a thousand times, how many times do I expect to land on an even number? You take a thousand, you multiply it by a half, and I would expect that 500 times I would land on even numbers. That's what that means. Now, if you actually did it, it might be 499 or 498 or 501. But if I ran it a million or a trillion times, the the exactness of getting to a half of the number of spins will get closer and closer to what I predict the more trials that I do. I keep em emphasizing that to you because that is really the core of probability. The more trials you do, the closer and closer you get to the probability you calculate of one half. All right, next question. Claire puts the marbles, puts marbles, uh, put, puts the marbles shown below in a bag and pulls one out. What is the probability she will pull out a blue marble? So you write down here, the probability of getting a blue marble is what? You ask yourself, how many different ways can I get blue? How many ways can I get the outcome I want? Blue marble, there's two of them. Out of a total of how many marbles? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So two out of ten. If you reduce this down, divide by two, divide by two, you get one fifth. And one fifth, you can write it as a decimal, 0 0.2. When you divide that, you get 0 0.2. So the probability of blue works out to be one fifth, and this is the final answer, one fifth, or 0 0.2, or you could write it as 20% because it's the same exact thing. Same way of, do, of saying the same thing. So one fifth of the time. All right, let's take a look at the next problem. Peyton pulls the marbles, uh, uh, in the, uh, puts the marbles in a bag below and pulls one out. What's the probability he will pull out an orange or a gray marble? A orange or gray. So probability of orange or gray. So we have to figure out how many ways can we get orange or gray? Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight possible ways of getting orange or gray out of a total of 10. We already know there's 10 of them here. 8 out of 10. And so you can reduce this, divide by 2, divide by 2, you'll get 4 fifths. And when you divide that in a calculator, you'll get 0 0.8. So you can represent it as a fraction or a decimal. So I'm just going to say the probability is 4 fifths. And of course, you could write it as 0 0.8, or you can change it to a percentage, which would be 80%. And it makes sense that 80% of the time you would expect to get orange or gray, because look, almost all the marbles in there are orange or gray, eight out of 10 of them. Now, if I did this experiment once, I could pull a blue. If I did it uh, you know, uh, three times in a row, I could still get three blues in a row. But if I did this experiment uh, 500 times, or 5,000, or 50, or 50, or 100, or 200,000 times, then I would get closer and closer to the calculated percentage of 80% or four-fifths of the time getting orange or gray. So let me take this down. We have a couple more, and we'll call this lesson a day. All right, our next problem says Cassie spins the spinner below. What is the probability the spinner will land on an orange space? So probability of orange. How many ways can we land on an orange space? Well, we have four orange positions. So four positions we can land on orange out of a total of eight possible positions. And if you divide top and bottom by four, you get one half. And so the probability of getting orange, I'll put probability of getting orange uh, with an O there, is one half, which is 0 0.5, which is the same as 50%. And it makes sense because half of the spaces are orange. So you expect to half the time to land on an orange space and the other half the time to land on a gray space. All right, next problem. She spins the spinner again. What is the probability the spinner will land on a gray even number? So not just a gray, but a gray even number. So that probability of being a gray even number, how many ways can we do it? Here's a gray even number. Here is a gray even number. There's two positions. These are gray odd numbers. So gray even number is two positions out of a total of eight positions. 
divide by 2, divide by 2, you get 1 fourth, which is 0 0.25, or equivalently 25%. So the probability is 1 fourth. So 1 fourth of the time, or 25% of the time, I expect to land on a gray square, uh, uh, position that's also an even number. And here's our last problem. We spin the spinner one more time. What is the probability the spinner will not land on an orange odd number? Not land on an orange odd number. So where are the orange odd numbers? Okay, so here are the orange numbers. Which ones are the odd ones? Okay, so we have here's an orange odd and here's an orange odd. There's two positions. We're asking what is the probability we will not land on these? So basically we can land one, two, three, four, five, or six different positions. Six different positions out of a total of eight, because the orange odd ones are here. Every other position is the ones we want. So there's six positions we can land on out of a total of eight. Divide by two, and divide by two, you get three-fourths, which is 0 0.75, which is 75%. So the probability is three-fourths, or 75%. So 75% uh, percent is the answer to this question, or three-quarters. So we've learned how to calculate probabilities in a variety of different cases, but notice that it's always the same story. When you have the probability of doing X or Y, you just see how many ways can I get what I'm looking for divided by how many total outcomes are there. And then that's the probability. And that means if I perform a large number of trials, for instance, in this case, I would expect to get this situation to happen three-fourths of the time. And as I do more and more and more trials, I will get closer and closer to that ideal calculation of three-fourths of the time as I do infinite number of trials. More and more and more. It's called sort of the fundamental idea behind probability. If you do infinity number of trials, then the probability you calculate becomes closer and closer to reality. So I'd like you to solve these, and then follow me on to the next lesson. We'll continue calculating probability and learning how to interpret the results.